Hello, this is Bill Hall talking to you again about Diedrich Bonhoeffer, the series. We're doing a series on the podcast about what formed him. And the first session we talked about the spiritual formation, his family, his parents, those kinds of things, that he came from aristocracy, that he was brilliant, that he had courage, he was brave, all of those kinds of things. But in this second session, we're going to be talking about the seeds of greatness, how these things were manifested. He was a contrarian by nature. Bonhoeffer was stand against even great theologians at the University of Berlin who didn't agree with him, and he didn't agree with them, and they were much more liberal than him, and he stood up to them. Uh, he was only in his you know, 20s. Early, not only early 20s, he got his PhD at 21. So it was when he was actually in his late teens that he was actually this stubborn about what he believed in. When he went to New York after he graduated, he spent a year in New York at Union Theological Seminary, uh, a bastion of liberalism then and still remains quite liberal now. But in that particular setting, he met Reinhold Niebuhr, a very powerful figure, someone lionized by the press in Time magazine on the cover a number of times, uh, kind of the darling of the leftist elite, uh, of the those who believed in that systemic sin was greater than personal sin and that the nation needed to be forgiven for its sin. And, you know, there's some elements of truth in all of that, but Bonhoeffer didn't respect union. He didn't respect their methodology. He didn't respect their theology. He thought they were just doing ad hominem kind of attacks on fundamentalists, and they weren't really taking it all seriously. And then he came back to Germany after that year, and there he began to get into apprenticeship. And one of the great stories is how he went to a church in Berlin that eventually they wanted him to be the youth pastor. And here's this brilliant guy who has all of this voluminous knowledge of theology, but he had to deal with boys from uh, homes that were not uh, like the home he grew up in, uh, disadvantaged young men. And he dealt with them and he reached them. He was persistent uh, when he was a chaplain at a university near there. There was absolutely no interest in what he had to offer. He would hold seminars and nobody would come. But he just thought, they're Philistines. And that's, again, that part of that confidence that he was bred with. But Bonhoeffer had these seeds of greatness that he would need again and again and again to step into that gap between the oppressor, the Nazis, and those who were oppressed, many of the people, but primarily the Jews. And so I hope you will enjoy this program. It uh, was very enlightening in doing the preparation for it. Welcome to the Bonhoeffer Show with Bill Hull and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Wait, I thought Bonhoeffer was dead. Who is Bill Hull? He doesn't sprechen Sie Deutsch, and he doesn't even like sauerkraut. Okay. This is Steve Simmons, and Bill paid me to say this. Bill Hull is tall, good-looking, well-dressed, and smells pretty good. He's written over 30 books. Not one of them is about Bonhoeffer. He went to Bonhoeffer's home in Berlin, and the woman in the front yard wouldn't let him in. He did lecture on Bonhoeffer at Oxford University. They eventually asked him who he was, and he was promptly thrown out. But, ladies and gentlemen, and all the others listening to this podcast, here he is anyway. The husband of Jane, a father, a grandfather, Bill Hall. Hello, everybody. This is Bill Hall with Brandon Cook and Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He's now third banana because we can't find him. Yes, uh, we talked about him last week. Uh, we're talking about him now for several weeks because, it, after all, it is the Bonhoeffer show and we have to talk about him at some point. But uh, seriously, he is such a inspiration to us. And while we're not 
necessarily that in total sync with him theologically or in other ways, uh, we find in general that Bonhoeffer is a man to be followed, and we thank him for his influence. We talked about his early life in our last program, and we said that there were four things that really did demonstrate themselves to be strongly the seeds of greatness for him. Status, brilliance, confidence, and courage. Now today, we want to talk about Bonhoeffer at age 25. Uh, A 25-year-old Diedrich Bonhoeffer was no lightweight. He combined his social status as a scion of Berlin intellectual elite with two doctoral degrees and a contrarian personality to position himself for influence. He had challenged Reinhold Niebuhr and the Union Theological Faculty in New York City during his nine-month stay there. Bonhoeffer said that in America, Christians fashioned their theology like a man orders his car from a factory. All ideas were on the table if they could serve a useful end. Now he would do the same with the theologian he most admired, Karl Barth. The 49-year-old Barth was just starting his church dogmatics, that nine-volume masterwork that, I have to be honest, I've only read parts of it. It's just unlike Eugene Peterson, who would read it for hours. uh, It just doesn't turn my crank exactly like it did for Peterson. Uh, His attempt to rebuild the crumbling edifice of Christian orthodoxy. That's what Bart did. Almost single-handedly, Bart moved all of theological Europe from the far left into the middle of the theological spectrum, a new place called neo-orthodoxy. Bart believed that theology bore no responsibility for changing society. He believed that theology makes nothing happen. Bonhoeffer argued that theology is of no use if it's not rooted in reality. Bart's students worshipped him. Bonhoeffer admired him, benefited from him, and then challenged him. That was Diedrich Bonhoeffer at 25. At age 25, he was eligible for ordination and took part two part-time jobs. The first was a chaplain at a technical university in Berlin as an unpaid lecturer in the theology department at the University of Berlin. Now, that's an interesting way that you would begin. After two doctorates, two sets of oral examinations, going through written comprehensive tests, going through the gauntlet, that was the academy in those days, uh, then you get an unpaid job with no office. (laughs) That's, uh, That's starting low. A few years later, Bonhoeffer would say that he no longer believed in the university, but before he could begin his unpaid job, he would need to complete a full slate of comprehensive examinations. Now, just before he began his new duties, he attended a World Alliance Conference in Cambridge, England. He created quite a store with his belief that there could be harmony among nations. His views were rejected by the German delegation as both naive and unpatriotic. Upon return to the yellow brick train station on the corner of Wilhelmstrasse, his father's chauffeur waited in the black Mercedes to pick Dietrich up, just to remind us that he was a young man of privilege. He may not have had a paying job, but he had his creature comforts, and this is an important feature of Bonhoeffer's life. He slept on silk sheets. He began his new assignment at Berlin Technical University, and it was to prove very frustrating. He he offered to lead discussion groups on stimulating theological subjects. He found zero interest. Now, think, you've been all through all of this, and now you have a job, and you lay out, hey, I, I'm going to lay out all this information I have, this great brilliance. No one even showed up. He confessed that he felt like a housewife who prepared great meals, but no one was hungry. Students would tear down. His flyers that he posted for the meetings. He came up with a new program, but again, no interest, only opposition. He offered lectures, prayer services, study groups, all rejected by the students. He did have one student show up once. Morning devotions were canceled because of lack of interest. He posted his office hours. He would sit for hours. No one came. Finally, there was some interest shown if he would hold his discussion at a beer hall and would pay for the beer. Not much has changed, actually, in the last uh, 50 years. Bonhoeffer was not discouraged as much as he was insulted by these Philistines. This goes back to his confidence, his sense of rightness. He just knew better than the less noble, the undereducated. 
He now turned to the job at the University of Berlin. For years, his rise had been impressive, the schooling, the special friendships, the academic praise being taken seriously. Now he arrived at the great University of Berlin, joining the faculty whose political orientation he no longer shared, a church that was corrupt and dull. He would sit in his office and grade papers alone. Finally, on the 15th of November, 1931, ordained Bonhoeffer was ordained to ministry at St. Matthias Church. He was now eligible to preach and administer the sacraments. He, like Bart, would now stand in the strange new land of the Bible and let its wild and crooked tree grow freely without constraint. I just love that statement. Even italicized it in my notes. He would stand in the strange new land of the Bible and let its wild and crooked tree grow freely without constraint. Because, you see, this was the main difference between Bonhoeffer and Bart and the very liberal University of Berlin, is that they believed that the Bible had something to say. Uh, Bart was famous for saying, when you read the Bible, just for a moment, entertain the idea that it could become the Word of God. He began his work as a pastoral assistant at Zion Church in the worst part of Berlin. Fifty boys fell under his supervision, a youth group. This is what is so great about the church. It's a great level or even a better teacher. He discovered the only way he could bring boys under control were Bible stories of David and Goliath, Samson crossing the Red Sea, the plagues in Egypt. He threw himself into the privation and the unemployment that beset the boys' families. He visited in their homes He counseled and prayed with them. Quite a change for this son of privilege. He would play Negro spirituals. He taught them to play chess, read scriptures, tell stories, and a bit of catechizing to boot. His work in the inner city of Berlin made Bonhoeffer aware of the limits of his training. It made him recall that theologians and theology are the servants of the church. In fact, when asked to describe his work at Zion Church, he said, What a liberation! He loved the retreats. The boys would sit with him as they discussed the joys of the devotional life, of prayer, of contemplation, of the beauty of the Harz Mountains. It was during this time that Bonhoeffer was struck with the simplicity and directness of Jesus' teaching and the concreteness of their demands. These were the roots for his most famous work, The Cost of Discipleship. It led to the young Bonhoeffer that stepped to the lectern at his debut as a teacher. A young scholar stepped to the rostrum, said, this is a person who is now describing Bonhoeffer. He stepped there with a light, quick step, a man with very fair, rather thin hair, a broad face, rimless glasses with a golden bridge. After a few words of welcome, he exclaimed that meaning and structure of the lecture in a firm, slightly throaty way of speaking. Then he opened his manuscript and began, and here are his words. He quotes, his first words have have now traveled through the decades. He said that it's not unusual to hear people ask whether the church still has relevance, whether they still need God. And I might add, this is the question we ask. It's a question we hear uh, asked by many, many people at different levels of our culture. But the question is wrongly put, Bonhoeffer said. The paramount concern is this, and this is what makes him Diedrich Bonhoeffer, 25 years old, remarkable mind, great courage, because here's what he says, whether we are willing to offer our lives to the church and the world for this is what God desires. You see, the question is wrong. Is the church relevant? No. The question is, are we relevant? Are we willing to offer our lives to the church? Because this is what God desires. And with that, the young Bonhoeffer was on his way. Well, in just a moment, Brandon Cook and I will discuss the greatness of Bonhoeffer. We'll talk about, you know, what is, what made him tick? uh, What was powerful? Why was he able to struggle uh, and be involved in the church struggle? And so as soon as we hear from Steve Simmons tell you about how you can be involved in the Bonhoeffer Project and how you can uh, benefit from being on our website and subscribing to this podcast and all those kinds of things, uh, we'll be right back. 
The Bonhoeffer Show is brought to you by The Bonhoeffer Project. As Bill said, The Bonhoeffer Project turns leaders into disciple makers. Jesus calls us as his disciples to make more disciples. But why should we make disciples? What are disciples? How does one make disciples? And who should join us? If you are interested in accomplishing what you agreed to do when you decided to follow Jesus, then inquire at thebonhoefferproject.com. You may qualify to become a member of one of our cohorts. The Bonhoeffer Project has cohorts spread across the U.S. and in several countries of the world. And remember to subscribe to The Bonhoeffer Show by going to the website, thebonhoefferproject.com. There you'll see the Bonhoeffer Show button. Click it and subscribe. Or go to iTunes, then type in The Bonhoeffer Show. And now, back to you, Bill. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, Brandon Cook, you recently turned 40. You know, if you were living in the Middle Ages, you'd be old, frail, gray, and have no teeth. But here you are at age 40, and you're looking pretty good. That's not exactly right. Well, maybe. I mean, we think everybody died in the the Middle Ages. Not everybody turned old early. It's just that they died young. They didn't get gray gray hair, necessarily. You don't think so? Or wooden teeth, or no teeth, or... Well, it it would have have been terrible, that's for sure. But here we are talking about a man in his 20s, a man of privilege and power, but of courage and inner strength. Uh, People don't seem to understand how much power they have, and when they do realize their power, they usually don't think they have enough of it. Therefore, they want more, and when they get more, they abuse it. So why didn't uh, Bonhoeffer fall prey to this problem? What do you think... uh, Why was he able to be so persistent? You know, just like this job we talked about, he had where nobody seemed to be interested, but then he he worked with the boys, and it was a very liberating thing. Just kind of general impressions, first of all. Well, resilience, you know, I don't know how much resilience is inborn and how much is is trained. I think it's definitely trained, and I think some people have a natural resilience in their their personality. So, um, I mean, clearly his resilience to just keep on going, he, he always, he, he's an example of someone choosing to do the next right thing and a low, low threshold for discouragement, I guess. Uh, but it also, it reminds me of something that you and I have talked about often, Bill, which is the, the old, it's really as old as the, the Greeks, I don't, I think it's as old as the Stoics or, or older, the pattern of transformation, which is that your practices, well, your desire can be funneled into practices, your practices become your habits and your habits become your character. So uh, clearly he practiced continually uh, resilience, determination, giving himself uh, to others for the sake of love over and over again until it became an habitual way of living. So, uh, you know, I imagine his choice to go from America to, to Germany made all the sense in the world for him. It was the next right thing. And he had trained his habit to do the next right thing, whether it was comfortable or uncomfortable. The miracle to me is that this was a man who was used to creature comforts and that, that those did not hold a greater uh, lull or sway over him. Um, but I think it speaks to the power of of commitment and the power of having trained your character. It reminds me of Dallas Willard's que- question, which he often asks in different ways. Uh, how does one naturally become the type of person who easily, routinely does good? And I think Bonhoeffer would be a testament that, well, through training. Yeah, you know, I, I think of Bonhoeffer, the contradictions of Bonhoeffer. When he was in Barcelona, he was a youth pastor. This happened uh, after he graduated and after he'd come back from New York uh, the first time. He was uh, in Barcelona as a youth pastor. And Barcelona was hot, you know, a different climate than Germany. And Bonhoeffer, he joined the German club. He joined the tennis club. He He needed opera tickets. He had needed four sets of tennis clothes that he, he wrote this long list uh, to his parents, and they sent everything plus the money. That's, that's a life. And he, he was living the good life, man. And he, he, uh, the first thing he wanted to know was how much vacation he had and, and how much he could travel. So this was Bonhoeffer. At the same time, he's this courageous person who won't sign the Aryan Clause, who stands up and protests right. and, uh, and, and challenges men twice his age. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the uh, loyalty oath to Hitler, uh, the Muslim decree that prohibited pastors from mentioning in sermons or discussions with parishioners related to the church crisis, 
uh, and uh, the pressure kept the pressure was on the church, yet he he resisted it, and and maybe as you said early in an earlier program, it could be that it's a person's reaction to crisis, a person's reaction to trouble and difficulty that makes them great. Like if Churchill, if there hadn't been the Nazis, if there hadn't been World War II, then Churchill would have just been another interesting person. Or think of Lincoln. Yeah. Sure. I think there's a myth of rising to the occasion that we're going to, well, it's okay. If, 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 if a catastrophe happens, I'll rise to the occasion. But I don't think that's true. The reality is, we train ourselves in the small things so that when a big thing comes, we're ready to respond as we would as if it was a small thing. I mean, Jesus even says this. He's faithful in little, will be faithful in much. Right. And so I think Bonhoeffer is a case of we probably wouldn't know of him. Well, we wouldn't know of him like we do today, save for the fact that he had trained himself such that when the big crisis came, he was ready to step into it. And, uh, you know, it makes me think of Todd Beamer and those who who took down the plane that would have crashed into to the, was it the White House? The Pentagon, the White House. Um, you know, they... They trained themselves. Todd Beamer had trained himself in that moment to respond with courage. That wasn't the first courageous thing he'd ever done. I guarantee you that. And so it's inspiration that we may not have a crisis that throws our life into the relief of uh, saintdom, as Bonhoeffer did, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but we can train ourselves. Let's roll. That was the name yeah, of that exactly. book. His wife wrote. Yeah, wasn't exactly, it? exactly. Let's roll. Yeah. You know, she, she, was, she and I had the same literary agent. Really? Yeah. And uh, for some reason, he paid a lot more attention to her than he he did to me. <laughs> Don't take it personal. I, I think he made. It's all about sales. Uh, I'm he, sure. he made a good penny on that. Uh, yes, Lisa Beamer, right? Uh, yes, I believe that was uh, her name. I don't know if she's remarried by now, uh, but yes. Now, here's the interesting thing: uh, there was pressure mounting on the church. And in 1934, there was the Barman Declaration, which Karl Barth largely pinned. And uh, that's where they said, look, uh, the church is free to be the church. This was about religious liberty in Germany. It really wasn't about the Nazis directly, even though the Nazis were putting pressure on them. Uh, The Nazis were doing everything they could to encroach on the church. But that uh, this is something that where they stood up and said, look, we have to be free to speak truth to powers the way we say it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he, he stood up now. It was during this time. And I I just wanted to read this to you, Brandon, because I, for some reason think you might kind of like this lifestyle. Uh, This was uh, Bonhoeffer's daily routine when he went to London for 18 months and he pastored two small German speaking congregations there was a lot of trouble on going on back home, but he he would arise around eleven a.m. Obviously, didn't have children. Yeah, followed by a sumptuous breakfast and a copy of the London Times delivered at the house. So, so far, so good. And he had a housekeeper. That's even better. He'd work on his sermon until about three o'clock, and then and his colleague at that point would have a light lunch. They would talk and debate and play music until it was time for the theater <laughs> or cinema. What are you talking about me? Everybody would love yeah. this. Followed by drinks and dinner, more conversation and storytelling in around 2 or 3 a.m. Uh, so he made, this was his daily routine. He made many important contacts for the church struggle and also gained 15 pounds while he was there. <laughs> and uh, many visitors and guests, I, I have to find this is interesting. Uh, the housekeeper had a nervous breakdown <laughs> and was institutionalized. Bonhoeffer called it a case of religious madness. <laughs> what does that mean? I have no idea. And by the way, he began to preach about the dangers of the perversion of Luther's by faith alone at this time. And uh, it must mean more than lazy piety or abstract intellectualism. This is when he begins to push back against the ruinous deed. Yes. Say a little bit about the ruinous deed for our listener. Well, that ruinous deed that he's pushing back against is how people had taken justification by faith and altered it to mean uh, that salvation by grace alone is a passive affair. Yeah, passive. And that you don't, you just sign off on it like we do in America, that mistakenly understanding 
faith as agreement. Faith is a lot more than agreement. Uh, So Bonhoeffer is such a thorn in the side of the church that Bishop Heckel travels from Berlin to London and summons Bonhoeffer to the Savoy Hotel. Now, we both know enough about England to realize that we don't stay at the Savoy. No. I don't know what it is, but it's got to be probably a thousand a night. Uh, not U.S. And so the bishop is flanked by two brown shirts. Heckel lays down the law to Bonhoeffer. You must sign the unconditional loyalty to the Third Reich and its Fuhrer. Bonhoeffer walked out of the Savoy, vowing never to waste any more time with this this fine pack of scra- scoundrels, he called them. The German, German church had become a ship of fools. And in 1934, the new cross of the German church the Luther, was the Luther Rose. The sacred heart enfolded in a white rose was now entwined with the swastika. That's what has happened. Yet this guy, in his 20s at this point, maybe, yeah, that he's able to just walk out and thumb his nose at the bishop. And this is what courage is. This is what greatness is. And he's such a young man. Um, could this happen in the United States? Nazism, you mean? Fascism? Or, or, or fascism, I guess, of one sort or another. wouldn't be the exact same thing. Probably we wouldn't fall prey to a little guy with a mustache. But uh, yeah. what do you think? Well, I think we'd be foolish to say it couldn't happen here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if it were any totalitarianism, left or right, communism, fascism, you know, you, you get the, the, the right, or I guess I should say the wrong economic settings, and you never know what's going to happen. Uh, I think prosperity is a is a bulwark of sorts against... Uh, totalitarianism, um, but I think should the should the economy collapse? Should we have the wrong economic situations? It'd be far more likely. Uh, I think, barring that, what we're witnessing now uh, is I, I don't think we know the long term effects of how our technology is keeping us from is leading us away from thoughtfulness, is leading us away from even civility. Um, entertainment culture making us think that every we should be we should be entertained at all times um and the internet creating a belief in us we don't have to interact with with real people we can say cruel things and there'll be no consequence i think these are dangerous ingredients in the pot and of course going back to so this would take us to neil postman who you right. and I have both been reading he, he talks about the difference between orwell and uh, huxley orwell in 1984 uh warned against a totalitarian state that would control by power um, Huxley warned against a state that there would no, be no need to control because everyone would be so medicated and so numbed out and so sedated by chemical, uh, in our case, by entertainment, that there would be no need to control the populace. And I think, you know, Neil Postman's point in Amusing Ourselves to Death, his brilliant book from the early 80s, how prescient he was, is uh, that that Huxley was right. And uh, so barring a sort of economic collapse, I think we might see a totalitarianism that is born of our own, uh, a populace that becomes increasingly flaccid and weak and unable to muster the differentiation or the resolve to um, to elect strong leaders, that we might go the, the way of Rome um, and kind of fade into an oblivion. Um, and I think Donald Trump, whatever you think of Trump, certainly his lack of civility, his, his coarseness is a... Uh, is, is is a symptom is a man is is a manifestation of the problem not the problem itself it's a symptom of something that's deeper in the uh in american culture right now well i think it's it, i think you see it on both sides of the uh political aisle uh it's just more cartoonish and more uh Caricature. magnified in trump than it is in uh, those who people who are on the other side but I think you see just as much meanness uh, and sometimes even worse uh, comments made about him. So they actually end up becoming like him. And so if you could say, well, he's lowered the level of discourse, and I think that's true, but also other people have gone along with it. 
and the culture is that way. That's why I'm saying he's a symptom of the problem across the culture. Right. Not its, not a, not its sole manifestation. So, yeah, and I think the coronavirus demonstrates our vulnerability, how easily and how fast things could change, Mm -hmm. how weak we are in some ways, and then we see strengths. Uh, Can our resources, when uh, leaders stand up and say, you know, we we have money, we can compensate for all this, we can save people pain, we can avoid all these kinds of problems that maybe some of these developing countries have, Yes, uh, that's true to a certain level, but someday, you know, we're going to run out of runway, financial runway in our country. Uh, when we keep borrowing from ourselves and from others and we're going to have to yeah. mortgage Yellowstone and we're leveraging the and, future. Uh, hey, sure. hey, how much for the Rocky Mountains? Can we give uh, somebody want to buy the Rockies? <laughs> These are the kinds of things we're going to end up doing. And uh, that's an entirely different discussion. I'm no economist, but. At least I have some common sense, I think, about these things. Well, I think it's time for a break. And uh, we're going to hear more from Steve Simmons now. And he's going to tell us a little bit about how you can get involved. If you want to go deeper into Bill's and the Bonhoeffer's teachings, go to www.thebonhoefferproject.com. There you'll find videos, books, and other resources that present both the problem and the solution to the disciple-making challenge facing today's Christian community. You can join a cohort or read Bill's and other Bonhoeffer Project team members' blogs and connect to Bill's books and articles. Remember to subscribe to The Bonhoeffer Show. Go to iTunes and do it today. We need to hear from you so Bill can answer your questions. All of Bill's answers are guaranteed to make you better looking, lose 10 pounds, and the IRS to write you a very big refund check. Well, not really, but you get the idea. Now, back to the king of culture for critical analysis of whatever crosses his mind. Take it away, Bill. Well, under the, uh, I guess, the auspices of current events, I want to talk a little bit about something that Recently, uh, I experienced, I was in Orlando, and it was for the Exponential Conference, and Discipleship.org held a pre-conference that I was involved with, uh, with some disciple-making leaders from around the country. Uh, These, um, and and the the person who was uh, leading that was uh, Shadonki Johnson. He's from uh, Sierra Leone. And in the last decade, they've baptized 1.5 million Muslims in that country and surrounding countries. My goodness. That's more people baptized, Muslims baptized, than until 10 years ago, uh, going back to the very beginning uh, of the life of Muhammad. So that's quite a remarkable movement of God. And uh, Sunaki was talking about how he believes this can happen in America. And right now we're told that there are no disciple-making movements in America. And uh, disciple-making movement, we've talked about this on some of our programs. So you have to refer back to it. But essentially, it's where uh, there are many, many churches that are multiplying to the fourth generation. And out of that, it just exponentially grows. And it's a, a kind of a mathematical formula, so to speak, or at least revealed in mathematics. And then uh, Sadanki was talking about how he thinks this can happen in America, but it's going to take years for it to take place. And when he started talking about it, he said that in America we have a lot of reasons, and we've just been talking about some of those reasons, Brandon. We've been talking about Uh, the comforts we have, uh, the confidence we have in the flesh, uh, the fact that, and Sadaki says it this this way, Americans walk by sight, Hmm. not by faith. And I think he's right on, uh, because we haven't been forced to walk by faith. Uh, It's uh, much easier to depend on other kinds of things, the right arm of uh, ability, power, all these kinds of things, But he said this, in Sierra Leone, we have the same devil you have. (laughs) 
uh, he's just as wily in our culture as he is in yours. Now, he's operating differently. He's too smart to operate the same way. And uh, we're talking about disciple-making movements today and disciple-making churches, and I ran across this article. Well, can I say one thing yeah, about that? Yeah, please do. That you just reminded me of? Yeah. Sh- Shidoki? Am I saying that right? Uh, Sadonki. Sadonki. I spent hours trying to figure out the right way to say it and so it wouldn't sound like donkey, but it's Sadonki. Okay, Sadonki. So that reminded me of two things. One, the prosperity of America. It reminds me of the book of Deuteronomy where the people of Israel are explicitly warned. Once you go into this land and everything's great, milk and honey flows and the grapes are as big as your fists, don't forget me. The warning is there in the Bible. Mm -hmm. The, The inverse relationship between prosperity and devotion, perhaps, or the potential for that relationship. Um, so I think any, pro- not just America, but any prosperous society has the potentiality to lose their uh, devotion. Secondly, the, you just reminded me, you know, anecdotally, I, I remember growing up, I would always hear stories about things happening around the world, the underground church in China, or miracles happening, you know, people <clears throat> even being raised from the dead and <clears throat> naturally wondering why those things don't happen here. And I don't know how many stories how many of those stories were true? Uh, but certainly in, in America, we don't even believe in the devil, or the devil has become a caricature. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I guess that goes back to my the first point: is there, if you're in a situation where you have greater dependence, does it lead to a, a direct correlation to faith? And I, I would like to know if all these things that I hear about around the world um, are true, the miracles that I hear about uh, in third world nations, developing nations. Or uh, whether that's just good PR. And I'm yes. sure our readers will probably have a lot of those stories and can confirm and corroborate them. Sure. I mean, I uh, I had one friend who was in India, and he claimed that uh, there were people raised from the dead, and he came home, and he said he needed some money. And he needed money for his ministry. And I said, okay, you just saw people raised from the dead. Can't you raise your support? And And he was able to go out and do it then, which was remarkable. But... <laughs> It's interesting how we have these non sequitur. It becomes a non sequitur, you know. Right. But uh, I-, I was wondering what you thought about uh, this Chuck Lawless, who is a professor at, I think, Southeastern or Southwestern uh, Theological Seminary. Nine reasons why churches think they're disciple-making churches when they may not be, because we've been told that 95% of churches in America are not disciple-making churches. And you see these nine things, Brandon? Just, uh, you don't have to read them all, but kind of wax eloquent on any one you want to. I'm reading over them right now. Uh, Sure. Basically, they they ascribe to the idea of the Great Commission and discipleship, so they must be a disciple-making church. Um, They're doing church, so that must be disciple-making. Disciple-making is programming. They talk about discipleship, so they must be disciple-making. Yeah, it's basically... You, it's, it, basically, I would sum this up as it's easier to talk the talk than it is to walk the walk. And it, it talks about the finishing programs or do it going through curriculum or information exchange mm-hmm. is, is not life on life. You know, and it seems like it seems to me that if you don't have the life on life, if you don't live it out in community in real life, in real time, that's when it doesn't take. That's when people, you know, gives modern information-based, uh, programmatic disciple-making gives disciple-making a bad name. I think that's what it tells us. Mm-hmm. Well, that goes back to the Reveal study so many years ago from Willow Creek, that just having discipleship classes doesn't, does not discipleship make. I think this is, a, that's a, this is a true point for all of society, though, not just churches. Everybody loves to talk about community. Very few people create it because community takes the hard work of honest relationships, feedback, and I, most people just want their comfort in easy relationships. I, I think m- the average person does not want the church to actually call them to their formation. That's a judgment. That's a, that's a large assertion. But I think people have been trained that the church is the place I go. Uh, and if I'm alignment with them, then I have a gold star. Uh, you know, I can, I can give them a gold star. They can give me a good gold star. We're in agreement. We're good. We're good before God. And we have the, theolo- you know, we, we end up equating our, theological orthodoxy, however, we define that as a way of being good or right. Uh, Being called to your formation is something far more different. Actually creating community 
is a very difficult discipline. And so uh, it's not, and that's not just in the church. That's across the board. People love to talk about community. Very few people create it. Jesus, you know, in John chapter 1, where it says, uh, probably John and, was it Andrew, that came up to Jesus and said, uh, where, where are you staying? He said, well, come and see. And the, the four days of John chapter 1, it's uh, something that people preach on. And it's interesting that during that period that he called them to follow him. It's a very simple thing, following him. It meant, you know, follow me, and if as your rabbi, because they called him teacher or rabbi, it meant to submit yourself to the rabbi, to his way of life, not to your way of life, that you're going to have to give up your way of life to follow that rabbi. And um, it seems to me that when people think about following Jesus now, it's sort of, Jesus, I would like to have you as my assistant. Mm-hmm. You know what? My secretary, my personal assistant, uh, I want to run my life, but essentially, I want to be in charge of it. And when I need you, I want you right there, right by my side, when I call upon you. Mm-hmm. And I think that this is fundamental to everything we're talking about and what you just said. So is there anything else that you that's bothering you today or that you find interesting you want to bring up at this point because this is your time? Well, I think I won't I'll just continue in this vein. I think what you brought up reminded me of Sky, uh, Sky Jathani's uh, you know the surveys they've done of of young people where the main view of God cor- current among young Christians is cosmic uh butler or divine therapist. In other words, the notion is we want God to make our lives a bit easier. And I think this is a problem with consumer Christianity. It's not just the younger generations. Consumer Christianity across the board inculcates a desire that God make life work. And to your point, Jesus invites us up to something completely upside down. If you want to have your life work, then live live a disciplined life of allegiance, uh, following God, following Jesus, and things will turn out. That's that's very different than wanting a, a divine butler or a cosmic or a cosmic butler or a divine therapist. So um, if we look at these things, from one point of view, we look at these things, we could get discouraged. Uh, But the good news is there's always hope for the church. There's always going to be rebirth as long as uh, God's spirit is active in the world. And and we need it. You know, we definitely need this. And I believe that our quest in the Bonhoeffer show and the Bonhoeffer project is to turn leaders into disciple makers. And the reason we want to turn leaders into disciple makers is because those leaders then make other disciples, but they have to come to terms with it themselves. And that's why we begin that way with them. And this year, like I've said, we've started off so well. Uh, We are doing uh, better than I think we've done in our history with getting people into cohorts, getting them moving with the quality of what we're doing. Uh, we're very excited about some of the new ideas that we're developing as well. And so, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of the thinking that we're doing can be found in a couple of our books that Brandon and I have done. One is called The Cost of Cheap Grace through Nav Press, which is came out just a few months ago, uh, actually two months ago. And then I'll create The False Promise of Discipleship, which is now available uh, on Amazon. Uh, this book by Brandon and I talks about how we ask the wrong questions and how we need to learn to ask better questions about how we might live for others. Because if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to, you're going to learn to, that it's about living for other people. So we want to say goodbye now for today. Thank you for being a part of our podcast family. Subscribe, tell your friends about it. Uh, we think it would be helpful in the disciple-making movement. And until next time, follow Jesus, and he will teach you everything you need to know. Well, we hope that the show wasn't too bad. Jane Hull wants everyone to know that if anything Bill said was offensive, (laughs) she feels your pain. If you were upset by anything Bill and his guests said, well, (laughs) mission accomplished. 
At the Bonhoeffer Show, we value irreverent, satirical, and generally inappropriate behavior. But when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission, we don't mess around. Remember, subscribe. We promise. No private jets, no white suits, and definitely no toupees.